Hello everyone, I am Dr. Mary Vinita Thomas, Assistant Professor, Department of Education, Central University of Kerala. Welcome to EPG Patshala. Today we will discuss the module on school education in United States. The main objectives of this module are to understand the structure of school educational system of United States, to know the policies behind the implementation of educational system of United States, to identify similarities and differences between educational systems as well as strengths and weaknesses of our country with other countries, to compare and contrast educational system of United States with India and other countries. To begin with, United States spends a lot for education than any other country. American students rank 14th worldwide in cognitive skills just behind Russia. The American educational system is unique unlike many other countries. Education is primarily the responsibility of state and local government. Each state has its own department of education and laws to regulate finance, the hiring of school personnel, student attendance and curriculum. States also determine the number of years of compulsory education. In most states, education is compulsory from 5 to 16. School education system of America. The American education system requires that students complete 12 years of primary and secondary education prior to attending a university or college. This may be accomplished either at public schools or at private schools. These 12 years of schooling may also be completed outside the US, thus giving foreign students the opportunity to pursue the benefits of the American education system and obtain a quality American education. Now let us see the public schools. Public schools, in public schools we have a huge variation among these schools regarding courses and subjects. Schooling lasts for 12 years until around age 18 and 16 in most states. Access is completely free to pupils in public schools. The public school systems are supported by a combination of local, state and federal government funding. Because a large portion of school revenues come from local property taxes, public schools vary widely in the resources they have available per student. Class size also varies from one district to another. Curriculum in public schools are decided at the local and state levels. The federal government has limited influence. In most districts, a locally elected school board runs schools. The school board appoints an official called the superintendent of schools to manage the schools in the district. The largest public school system in United States is in New York City, where more than 1 million students are taught in 1,200 separate public schools. New York City public school system is nationally influential in determining standards and materials such as textbooks. The admission to individual public schools is usually based on residency. To compensate for differences in school equality based on geography, school systems serving large cities and portions of large cities often have magnet schools that provide enrollment to a specified number of non-resident students in addition to serving all resident students. This special enrollment is usually decided by lottery with equal numbers of males and females chosen. Some magnet schools cater to gifted students or to students with special interests such as the sciences or performing arts. The next is private schools. Here, students must pay tuition fees and in private schools, they have pre-kindergarten, kindergarten of first grade and private schools determine their own curriculum and policies with voluntary accreditation available 
through independent regional accreditation authorities. About 87% of school-age children attend public schools, about 10% attend private schools, and more than 3% are homeschooled. Private schools in the United States include parochial schools affiliated with religious denominations, non-profit independent schools, and for-profit private schools. Private schools charge fees depending on geographic location, the school's expenses, and the availability of funding from sources other than tuition. Private schools have various missions. Some cater to college-bound students seeking a competitive edge in the college admissions process. Others are for gifted students, students with learning disabilities or other special needs or students with specific religious affiliations. Some cater to families seeking a small school with a nurturing, supportive environment. Unlike public school systems, private schools have no legal obligation to accept any interested student. Admission to some private schools is often highly selective. Private schools also have the ability right to expel unruly students, a disciplinary option not legally available to public school systems. And these schools have the following advantages too. Smaller classes, under 20 students in a typical elementary classroom, greater individualized attention, and expert college placement services. Unless specifically designed, private schools usually cannot offer the services required by students with serious or multiple learning emotional or behavioral issues. Now coming to formal education system in USA, generally there are elementary school, K to fifth grade, middle school, sixth to eighth grades, and high school, ninth to twelfth grades. Some schools differ in the grades they contain. Prior to higher education, American students attend primary and secondary school for a combined total of 12 years. These years are referred to as the first through 12th grades. Around age six, US children begin primary school, which is most commonly called the elementary school. They attend five or six years and then go on to secondary school. Secondary school consists of two programs. The first is middle school or junior high school, and the second program is high school. A diploma or certificate is awarded upon graduation from high school. After graduating high school, which is the 12th grade, US students may go on to college or university. College or university study is known as higher education. So now, dear students, let us have a look at the structural pattern of education in the United States. The first one, nursery school. It provides educational experiences for children immediately preceding the kindergarten and conducted during the regular school year. These schools are sometimes called pre-primary groups, child care centers, or cooperative nursery schools. A nursery class may be organized as a grade of an elementary school or as a part of a separate nursery school. The next is kindergarten. It provides educational experiences for children for the year immediately preceding the first grade. A kindergarten may be organized as a grade of an elementary school or as a part of a separate kindergarten school. In some school systems, it is called pre-primary or junior primary. The third one is the elementary school. It provides primary schooling and is composed of any span of grades not above grade eight. A nursery school or kindergarten school is included under this heading only if it is an integral part of a regularly established school system. Now moving on to junior high school. It is a separately organized secondary school 
intermediate between elementary and senior high school. The next one, four-year high school. It is a four-year secondary school immediately following elementary school in the eight plus four or in some instances, the seven plus four plan. This includes four-year vocational and trade high school. The next one is senior high school. It offers the final years of high school work necessary for graduation and leading to the high school diploma. It invariably precedes a junior high school in the same system. Now moving on to secondary education. Secondary education is often divided into two phases, middle or junior high school and high school. Students are given more independence, moving to different classrooms for different subjects and being allowed to choose some of their class subjects, that is electives. Then the middle school. This usually includes 6th, 7th and 8th grade and occasionally even 5th grade as well. Junior high may include any range from 6th through 9th grades. The range defined by either is often based on demographic factors such as an increase or decrease in the relative numbers of younger or older students with the aim of maintaining stable school populations. And then we have the high school. Occasionally, the senior high school. It usually runs from 9th or 10th through 12th grades. Students in these grades are commonly referred to as freshmen, that is the grade 9, sophomores, grade 10, juniors, the grade 11, and seniors, grade 12. Generally, at the high school level, students take a broad variety of classes without special emphasis in any particular subject. Students are required to take certain mandatory subjects, but may choose additional subjects like electives to fill out their required hours of learning. High school grades normally are included in a student's official transcript, example, for college admission. Each state sets minimum requirements for how many years of various mandatory subjects are required. And these requirements vary widely, but generally include two to four years of each of science, mathematics, English, social sciences, physical education, foreign language, art education, etc. A health curriculum in which students learn about anatomy, nutrition, first aid, sexuality, drug awareness and birth control is also included. Now let us see the types of schools in USA. The first type is the junior high school. These schools have been formed by taking away the two classes, that is classes 7th and 8th of the primary stage and class 9th of the secondary stage. The next is high schools or higher secondary schools. High school is the common term used in USA for a higher secondary school. Generally, the higher secondary classes consist of 10th, 11th and 12th classes. Then we have the comprehensive high schools. These schools include four classes, that is from 9th to 12th, which starts at the end of eight year courses of the primary stage. Then they have the specialized schools. Most of these are technical, commercial, art, agricultural and business schools. These schools provide introductory vocational training. Then next is the vocational and industrial school. These have been established mostly in big industrial cities of the country. These two are included in the category of specialized schools. Vocational education is an integral part of the secondary education in the USA. The primary object of vocational education is to provide a suitable background of students in order to increase their vocational skill. Then there are the part-time schools these are of two types, the continuation schools, which provide education for 144 hours during a year, that is three to four hours a week. And next is evening adult schools, which run their classes daily in the evening. The junior colleges, 
These comprise the first two classes of the college stage that is 13th, 14th. These colleges are helpful to those students who do not want to go to distant places for college education. So now, let's discuss the salient features, some important special features of secondary education in USA. The first salient feature is education for all. Today, 90% of boys and girls between the ages of 14 and 17 are enrolled in high schools. A secondary school education for every American youth, boy and girl is the goal of education in United States. Where it courses, students are given opportunities to select subjects in which they are most interested or which are related to the career they plan to follow. Some of the larger urban schools offer as many as 100 courses. The choice for the students is unlimited. Then the outside activities, in addition to classroom work, each student is encouraged to take part in one or more outside activities. Then students self-government, a democratic form of student self-government is found in most of the large high schools. And then the gymnastic, almost every school has a gymnasium for indoor sports and playing fields for outdoor athletics. The next, grading in attitudes. Students are graded not only in subjects, but also in their attitudes, which is very vital. Then we have the comprehensive type. The secondary schools in America have come to be known as comprehensive high schools because they offer many different subjects under one roof, preparing for different careers and accommodating both bright and not so bright students. The specialized type, there are also some specialized high schools chiefly in the large eastern cities which emphasize science or music and art, commercial and industrial course or pre-college academic subjects. Now coming on to the non-graded school. In a non-graded school, there is no reference to grades 1, 5 or 9. Pupils do not pass, fail or repeat grades. That is, there are no grades. Pupil advance at differing rates of speed. A single pupil advance at various rates in his several subjects. No sports and co-curricular activities in US. A major characteristic of American schools is the high priority given to sports, clubs and activities by the community, the parents, the schools and the students themselves. Extracurricular activities are educational activities not falling within the scope of the regular curriculum, but under the supervision of the school. These activities can extend to large amounts of time outside the normal school day. Homeschool students, however, are not normally allowed to participate. Student participation in sports programs, drill teams, bands and spirit groups can amount to hours of practices and performances. Most states have organizations that develop rules for competition between groups. These organizations are usually forced to implement time limits on hours practiced as a prerequisite for participation. Many schools also have non-varsity sports teams. Sports programs and their related games, especially football or basketball, are major events for American students and for larger schools and it can be a major source of fund for school districts. The high school athletic competitions often generate intense interest in the community. In addition to sports, numerous non-athletic extracurricular activities are available in American schools, both public and private. Activities include quiz bowl, musical groups, marching bands, student government, school newspapers, science fairs, debate teams and clubs focused on an academic area such as the Spanish club or a community service interest such as key club. So next, coming to homeschooling. Now homeschooling is something new to us as we don't have homeschooling here. In 2014, 
approximately 1.5 million children were homeschooled in US. This was 2.9% of all children. Many select moral or religious reasons for homeschooling their children. The second main category is unschooling, those who prefer a non-standard approach to education. Most homeschooling advocates are against established educational institutions for various reasons. Some are the following. Non-religious education as contrary to their moral or religious systems. They wish to add religious instruction to the educational curriculum. Unable to afford a church-operated private school. Available school may teach views contrary to those of the parents. More effectively tailor a curriculum to suit an individual student's academic strengths and weaknesses, especially those with singular needs or disabilities. Negative social pressures of schools such as bullying, drugs, crime, sex and other school-related problems are detrimental to a child's proper development. Opposition to homeschooling comes from varied sources such as teachers' organizations and school districts. The National Education Association, the largest labor union in the United States, raised its voice such as fears of poor academic quality and lack of socialization with others in case of homeschooling. Now let us have a look at the graden system in USA. In schools in the United States, children are constantly assessed throughout the school year by their teachers and report cards are issued to parents at varying intervals. Generally, the scores for individual assignments and tests are recorded for each student in a grade book along with the maximum number of points for each assignment. At any time, the total number of points for a student when divided by the total number of possible points produces a percent grade which can be translated to a letter grade. So now let's see early childhood education in USA. Daycare is one form of early childhood education. Daycare refers to early childhood settings that focus their goal on substitute care for children while their parents are absent or working outside. They could involve academic training or they could involve solely socializing activities. Daycare is not required and is not free. In fact, depending on the setting, it could be quite expensive. Daycare programs usually offer daily programs for up to 12 hours. Meals, depending on the school, may be provided by the family or by the school. Transportation to and from the program is generally the responsibility of parents. The preschool, also called pre-K or PK or pre-kindergarten refers to the first formal academic classroom based learning environment that a child customarily attends in the United States. It begins around the age of three in order to prepare for the more didactic and academically intensive kindergarten, the traditional first class that school children participate in. Many community-based programs, commercial enterprises, non-profit organizations, faith communities and independent child care providers offer preschool education. Preschool may be general or may have a particular focus such as arts education, religious education, sports training or foreign language learning along with providing general education. Now let us see the curriculum of schools in US. The curriculum in a public elementary education is determined by individual school districts. The school district selects curriculum guides and textbooks that reflect a state's learning standards and benchmarks for a given grade level. Curricula in the United States vary widely from district to district. Not only do schools offer a range of topics and quality, but private schools may include religious classes as mandatory for attendance. There is a debate over which subjects should receive the most focus with astronomy and geography among those cited as not being taught enough in schools. 
This description of school governance is simplistic at best. However, school systems vary widely not only in the way curricular decisions are made, but also in how teaching and learning takes place. Some states or school districts impose more top-down mandates than others. In others, teachers play a significant role in curriculum design and there are few top-down mandates. Curricular decisions within private schools are often made differently from that in public schools and in most cases without consideration of the NCLB, which is a No Child Left Behind Act. At times, an individual school district identifies areas of need within the curriculum. Teachers and advisory administrators form committees to develop supplemental materials to support learning for diverse learners and to identify enrichment for textbooks. Many school districts post information about the curriculum and supplemental materials on websites for public access. In general, a student learns basic arithmetic and sometimes rudimentary algebra in mathematics, English proficiency such as basic grammar, spelling and vocabulary, and fundamentals of other subjects. Learning standards are identified for all areas of a curriculum by individual states, including those for mathematics, social studies, science, physical development, fine arts and reading. While the concept of state learning standards has been around for some time, the No Child Left Behind has mandated that standards exist at the state level. Now let us see standardized testing in US. Under the No Child Left Behind Act, all American states must test students in public schools statewide to ensure that they are achieving the desired level of minimum education, such as on the New York Regents Examinations, the Florida Comprehensive Assessment Test, or the Massachusetts Comprehensive Assessment System. Students being educated at home or in private schools are not included. The Act also requires that students and schools show adequate yearly progress. This means they must show some improvement each year. When a student fails to make adequate yearly progress, the No Child Left Behind mandates that remediation through summer school or tutoring be made available to a student in need of extra help. Standardized testing has become increasingly controversial in recent years. Creativity and the need for applicable knowledge are becoming rapidly more valuable than simple memorization. Opponents of standardized testing have stated that it is the system of standardized education itself that is to blame for employment issues and concerns over the questionable abilities of recent graduates. Now, let's see the governance. The US federal government exercises its control through the US Department of Education. Education is not mentioned in the Constitution of the United States, but the federal government uses the threat of decreased funding to enforce laws pertaining to education. Under recent administrations, initiatives such as the No Child Left Behind Act and Race to the Top have attempted to assert more central control in a heavily decentralized system. Non-profit private schools are widespread, are largely independent of the government and include secular as well as parochial schools. Educational accreditation decisions for private schools are made by voluntary regional associations. The academic calendar. The school calendar usually begins in August to September and continues through May or June. The majority of new students begin in autumn, so it is a good idea for international students to also begin their US university studies at this time. 
the academic year at many schools is composed of two terms called semesters. Coming to education of children with disabilities. Children with physical disabilities, depending on the nature, extent of disability and availability of local specialized institutions, attend either such institutions or special classes within regular schools. As of 2007, there were 80 schools for the blind and the children with poor eyesight. Their school term is extended to 12 years and classes are limited to 9 to 12 pupils per teacher. Education for the deaf is provided by 99 specialized kindergartens and 207 secondary boarding schools. Children who were born deaf are admitted to specialized kindergartens as early as possible, ideally from 18 months of age. They are schooled separately from children who lost hearing after acquiring basic speech skills. The federal law, that is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, requires states to ensure that all government-run schools provide services to meet the individual needs of students with special needs as defined by the law. All students with special needs are entitled to a free and appropriate public education, the FAPE. Schools meet with the parents or guardians to develop an individualized education program that determines best placement for the child. Students must be placed in the least restrictive environment that is appropriate for the student's needs. Public schools that fail to provide an appropriate placement for students with special needs can be taken to due process wherein parents may formally submit their grievances and demand appropriate services for the child. So now dear students, uh, let us have a glimpse of the policies and provisions related to school education in USA. Government supported and free public schools for all began to be established after the American Revolution. Between 1750 and 1870, parochial schools appeared as ad hoc efforts by parishes. In 1823, Reverend Samuel Red Hall founded the first normal school, the Columbian School in Concord, Vermont, to improve the quality of the burgeoning common school system by producing more qualified teachers. Public education is universally available at the K-12 level and is available at state colleges and universities for those students who can afford to pay for it. K-12 public school curricula budgets and policies are set through locally elected school boards who have jurisdiction over individual school districts. State governments set overall educational standards often mandate standardized tests for K-12 public school systems and supervise usually through a board of regents, state colleges and universities. Funding comes from the state local and federal government. States passed laws to make schooling compulsory between 1852 and 1917. By 1870, every state had free elementary schools, although only in urban centers. Starting from about 1876, 39 states passed a constitutional amendment to their state constitutions called Blaine Amendments after James G. Blaine one of their chief promoters, forbidding the use of public tax money to fund local parochial schools. School districts are usually separate from other local jurisdictions with independent officials and budgets. There are more than 14,000 school districts in the country and more than 500 billion is spent each year on public primary and secondary education. Most states require that their school districts within the state teach for 180 days a year. Responding to many competing academic philosophies being promoted at the time, an influential working group of educators known as the Committee of Ten, established in 1892, 
by the National Education Association recommended that children should receive 12 years of instruction consisting of 8 years of elementary education also known as grammar schools followed by 4 years in high school. Gradually by the late 1890s regional associations of high schools, colleges and universities were being organized to coordinate proper accrediting standards, examinations and regular surveys of various institutions to assure equal treatment in graduation and admission requirements, course completion and transfer procedures. The 1946 National School Lunch Act, which is still in operation, provided low-cost or free school lunch meals to qualified low-income students through subsidies to schools providing the idea of a full stomach during the day. In 1965, the far-reaching elementary and secondary education act passed as a part of President Lyndon B. Johnson's War on Poverty provided funds for primary and secondary education. In 1975, the Education for All Handicapped Children Act established funding for special education in schools. Learning standards are the goals by which states and school districts must meet adequate yearly progress as mandated by the No Child Left Behind. The Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965 made standardized testing a requirement. The Higher Education Amendments of 1972 made changes to the Pell Grants. The 1975 Education for All Handicapped Children Act required all public schools accepting federal funds to provide equal access to education and one free meal a day for children with physical and mental disabilities. The 1983 National Commission on Excellence in Education report, famously titled A Nation at Risk, touched off a wave of local, state and federal reform efforts. The 2002 No Child Left Behind Act, passed by a bipartisan coalition in Congress, provided federal aid to the states in exchange for measures to penalize schools that were not meeting the goals as measured by standardized state exams in mathematics and language skills. So now we have seen school education in UK. Before concluding, let's have a brief review of the module. First, we reflected on school education in USA. We got an insight and better understanding of the formal education, the structural pattern of school education, the types of schools and curriculum in USA along with the governance. Finally, we also discussed on the different provisions and policies related to school education in USA. So with this, we come to an end of this module. Thank you.